Interesting title, isn't it? The last days, difficult times, and lovers of self. In the beginning, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son created the heavens, the earth, and all living things, including mankind, get this, in two genders, male and female, and then he placed them in the Garden of Eden. They were entrusted with the stewardship of God's creation and the responsibility to multiply and fill the earth with their offspring. They had the incredible privilege of personal face-to-face -face fellowship with God. There was only one rule. They weren't to eat the fruit of one specific tree in the garden and the rest was theirs to enjoy. Then Satan came on the scene with lies as he always does, causing Eve to doubt the integrity and motives of God. The verbal exchange between Eve and the devil is recorded in Genesis 3.1, and I have it printed for you there. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Verse 4, The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sold fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. <clears throat> they had broken God's law, and in a moment, everything changed. They began to age and die physically, which never happened before. And on the spiritual side, sin separated them from God, which is spiritual death. God says that the soul that sins, the person that sins, the person who breaks my law is going to die both physically and spiritually, says the Lord. Adam and Eve experienced the sensation of guilt for sin for the very first time. It, it was and the, the awful reality of being separate from God, fellowship that they had enjoyed for God only knows how long, had been broken, and it must have been horrific. Never before a sense of guilt, a sense of having done anything wrong. And they hid themselves in the bushes. That's kind of a silly thing to do when you're hiding from God. <laughs> they hid themselves in the bushes, and they made for themselves some makeshift clothing trying to cover their sin. But it accomplished nothing. And so our gracious God in Genesis 3.21 made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. In other words, God shed blood to cover the sin of Adam and Eve, which sacrifice pointed to the shed blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who alone could take away sin. Verse 22, And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he, he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever in his sinful condition. And therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden. Fellowship had been broken. No longer could they stay in the presence of God. He sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he is ta has, was taken. Verse 24, And so he drove the man out. Does that indicate that Adam and Eve were saying, no, 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 we want to stay here? I don't know if it does or not, but it says they drove them out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, 
He stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life so that no sinful man could return to paradise without faith in the appointed Redeemer, Jesus Christ. When our first parents sinned against God, they were fundamentally changed. They became sinners, not just by practice, but by nature and by desire. And that nature was passed on to all their children, including us. The evidence that this is so is seen first in the lives of their two sons, Cain and Abel. You're familiar with the story to some degree, I'm sure. These boys knew their parents' sweet fellowship with God and their expulsion from the garden because of sin. The story had been told in detail. They were aware that God forgave them when they believed in the promise of the coming Savior found in Genesis 3.15. As they were growing up, their parents taught them how God must be worshipped and how they were to live. Abel proved to be a true believer. Cain was not. Listen to Genesis 4 and now verse 3. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. And so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. The Lord received Abel's offering of a slain lamb. The the blood or the life of a lamb mirrored what God did in the garden to cover the sins of Adam and Eve and pointed to the crucifixion of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of all who come to him by faith. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. How rude is that? We've both come to worship and you don't like the stuff I brought you? No. No. I reject it. It's not what I commanded to be done. God had demonstrated how sin must be dealt with when he killed animals to clothe Adam and Eve. That sacrifice and all the subsequent subsequent sacrifices in the Old Testament foreshadowed the price Jesus would one day pay to save us from our sin. The perfect Son of God is the only suitable sacrifice for sinners. He is so because he kept the law of God perfectly from the cradle to the grave. He was and is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all who come to him. Why was Cain's offering rejected? It was rejected because you can't come to God except by faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot manufacture a covering for sin made of your best efforts. No, you must come by the appointed way through the death of a suitable sacrifice and his name is Jesus. You can't make up your own religion. So many people have told me, I said, are you a Christian? Oh, yes, I am. I, I spoke to a man many years ago uh, when I worked at the mines. And I said, are you a believer? I said, yes, I am, he says. And where do you go to church? He said, I don't go to church anywhere. I'm working out my own salvation as I see fit. Well, how's that working for you? I don't know where he's at, if he's still alive or not. But it doesn't fly. That's like this man knowing that God demands the sacrifice of a beast portraying the sacrifice of Christ in the future and he brings zucchini. He he just made it up. This is what he felt like. This is what he had. Maybe he didn't want to kill his prize animals. I don't know what motivated him, but he had no regard for the instructions that God had left to his parents and they passed on. As always, as is always the case, when a person is told they cannot manufacture their own religion, Cain became very angry. Who are you to judge me? Does that sound, <laughs> does that sound current, contemporary? He became very angry and his countenance fell and then the Lord said, why are you angry? And why is your countenance falling? That's what he's talking about. He had a, he had a sad face. 
He's all full of himself. I'm going to worship me and my brother going to worship me. And God says, you can't come into my presence like this, dude. You can't do it. If you do well, if you do right, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel, his brother, all of this. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. I can't help but think of the situation with our society today. Where it's gone beyond people saying, oh, I don't believe that, and walking away. They want to bust your skull. Because you stand there and tell them they're wrong. And that Jesus is the only way to God. And people all over the world are dying for that. Cain rose up against Abel and his brother and killed him. Both these men were born with rebel hearts, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Hearts that called them away from God to worship themselves and their fallen desires. Abel, by faith in the promised Savior, was given the strength to master or resist temptation. Cain had no faith and was therefore a slave of his own wicked heart, which led him into disobedience and finally to murder. How often are people told in this day to just follow your heart? You want to be happy? Just follow your heart. Let me ask you, how's that working for you? How's that working for you? You follow your own fallen heart into eternal destruction, dear ones. Well, fast forward about 1,600 years to the time just before God destroyed the world with a flood. And what do we find? We find millions, if not billions of human beings on the earth empty and seeking satisfaction in sex and drugs and in every sinful way possible. 1,600 years later, things have not improved. People have not learned to obey God and keep His commandments. The answer is they have not improved. And God does something astonishing. He destroys the entire with a flood, the world with a flood because, Genesis 6 and verse 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry I've made them. But Noah the believer found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And he built an ark, a giant ship by which God preserves select animals and only, are you ready? Eight people destroying the rest of humanity. Fast forward to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah where God destroyed the cities of the plain because the people in them were consumed with sexual immorality and and rebellion against all that was good and right in the eyes of God. Still, it seems, every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. God destroyed them. Fast forward to New Testament times and recall Paul's description of fallen humanity in Romans 1. And there we learn that God has written his law upon the hearts of every man and that creation reveals his attributes, power, and holy nature. And yet mankind ignores these truths, a screaming conscience, and proceeds to worship everything but God. They make gods of themselves. And again, God destroys them, this time by giving them over to their filthy, wicked imaginations so that their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. That's lesbianism. And in the same way also, the men abandon the natural function of the woman and burn in their desires toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error, the judgment of God in the form of disease 
When God gives mankind over to the imaginations and lusts of his heart, they are, verse 29 in Romans 1, filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, their gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know what is right, They know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, yet they not only continue doing these things, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. It seems that sinful man is the same in every age, doesn't it? Every intent of the thoughts of man's heart is evil continually. Wasn't it supposed to be the case that as we were educated, we would get better and better? As time went on, the archaic behaviors of crushing somebody's skull or stabbing them in the heart would pass away and we would be enlightened and and, uh, there would be peace on earth. It's not going to happen. It never has been and it never will be until the Lord Jesus comes back and straightens it all out. Jesus told the truth when he said, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. We are all born with a bad heart, and as we go through life, uh, uh, we develop a bad record proving that we have a bad heart. A bad heart and a bad record. That's us. Sign on the dotted line. Is this you? Well, let me, where's your pen? Give me your pen. This is who I used to be. You can say as a believer, because God's given you a new heart, but if it's still you, be honest, this is me, yeah, yeah, that's me. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we're not through with the bad news yet. Let's continue. Jesus told the truth when he said, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. And then, says Paul, Things are not going to get better with time. Look with me at 2 Timothy 3.1. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. <clears throat> but realize this, that in the last days... Now, when is that? What do you suppose? The Bible tells us in Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, that the last days began when Christ was born. We have been living in the last days all our lives, and the generations before us have been there as well. In these last days, it says, Hebrews says, uh, the prophets spoke the word of God, but in these last days, the Lord Jesus has appeared, and he is my prophet. So we're in the last days. One of these days we will come to the very last day. But just wanted you to understand that this, these two words don't specifically apply to uh, the last four days of history. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult, meaning fierce, savage, and dangerous times will come. You suppose there were fierce and savage days in history past oh my goodness before the flood oh my goodness in Sodom and Gomorrah oh my goodness in Rome World War I too in the last days difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self this is the key to the issue in our society I will do what I want, when I want, if I want, and I'm not doing anything else. And if you don't agree with me, I'm going to bust your face. You can't talk to me about things I don't believe. 
Don't you talk about Jesus. Don't you tell me I'm wrong. If I want to identify as a rabbit, it's none of your business and you better not contradict me because I might change myself into a tiger. Lovers of self. Lovers of money. Boastful. If you're a lover of self, you're not a lover of God. If you're a lover of money, if you're possessed by money, you're not following the Lord. Boastful, imposters, arrogant, proud, revilers, that is speaking evil against men and especially against God, blasphemy, disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unthankful. I wait when I'm watching a, a documentary and, and people are talking about uh, their success in life and how it just seems like everything's been laid out on the table for this person and there is not one acknowledgement of God and no indication of thanksgiving. They're just proud of the fact that they've pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps and sorted everything else out uh, even though other people can't do the same. Unthankful, unholy, as profane and wicked, unloving, without natural affection, normal to family relationships. Isn't that true? I don't love my father, my mother, my brother, my sister. I am who I am. And I'm not putting up with you saying I can't be that. They're irreconcilable. They can't be reasoned with or persuaded to conform to what is right. Malicious gossips telling devilish lies without self-control. That's the encouragement of our society, isn't it? Don't, don't restrict yourself. Be who you want to be. Do what you want to do. It's none of anybody's business. You don't even have to do it in secret anymore. Come out of the closet. Walk down the street. Turn the lights on without self-control. That is given over to one's passions without restraint. Brutal or savage. Haters of good, particularly good men or Christians. Treacherous, that is traitorous. Lovers, reckless, acting against warnings and common sense. Conceited, that is puffed up and proud. Lovers of pleasure, lovers of forbidden desires. Your conscience tells you, doesn't it? What's right and wrong? It tells you before you lay your hand to it. You know. God's written his law in the hearts of every man, he tells us. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, these are professing Christians, although they deny its power. They are not true believers, therefore they have no power to control their passions. How do we respond to professing Christians who continue to live in sin? Paul says, don't hang out with them. Avoid them, shun them, turn away from them. Have no fellowship with these people who name the name of Christ and live like worshipers of Satan. Self, sin, avoid such men as these. Verse 6, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Who are these ladies? Weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. These women are slaves of sin, self and Satan, as all unbelievers are. They have no power to resist, no truth to fight with. They have heard the gospel again and again, but have no grip on its meaning. They do not know Christ. Therefore, they are easily led astray by charlatan preachers. I remember when I was a boy. I remember uh, older ladies and not uh, everyone is, is easily duped but I saw some who listened to the likes of Oral Roberts and other frauds and phonies on uh, television and they would send them money that would take the very food off their table so that they could 
put fuel in their airplanes and, and whatever the case might be. These people, these sinful ladies, unbelieving ladies, are easily led astray. Perhaps they've been raised in church. They haven't been saved, so they don't understand the gospel. And some yahoo preacher comes along and says, this is okay, come with me, let's have our fill. Preachers who are themselves lovers of self, slaves of immorality, lovers of money, who will gladly lead their victims deeper into sin. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses so that these men oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. These names are found nowhere else in the Bible. The Jews either somehow knew their names or just attached them to the Egyptian magicians who stood against Moses as he performed the various miracles before Pharaoh, demanding that he set the Hebrew slaves free to worship God. They were, in fact, incapable of competing with the power of God. False teachers and false pastors will do a great deal of damage, but they cannot compete with God. When God does the miracle of salvation in a person's life, they are transformed. They are called out of the darkness of sin into his marvelous light. They're changed from the inside out. It's a miracle, and charlatans cannot be part of bringing that to pass. Look at verse 9 in 2 Timothy 3. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all. Just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. Verse 10, now says Paul, you followed my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, and my patience, my love, my perseverance, persecutions, and my sufferings, such as has happened to me at Antioch, where we, Timothy was with him in some of these places, where we were run out of town. At Iconium, where the Jews attempted to stone Paul and Barnabas, but they escaped. And at Lystra, where Paul was actually stoned, drug out of the city, and left for dead. And of course, he abandoned this Christian stuff because it was just too hard. No, he didn't. He healed up and carried on. What persecutions I endured, he said, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Paul is preparing young Timothy for what is coming. You have suffered with me in the past, he says, but I tell you, things are about to get worse than you can imagine. Indeed, 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. I'm not going to tell you that if you come to Christ, if you surrender your life to Christ, everything's going to be easy. It may very well become harder than you've ever experienced in your life because the world around you doesn't like Christ in you and doesn't want you talking about him. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is coming to us. It comes to the church in every age. Perhaps we are in the last, last days. A lot of people think so. It's fine with me one way or another, but it really doesn't make any difference as to how you and I carry ourselves and proceed. Paul says to Timothy, as to what, do, what am I supposed to do, perhaps he asked, with all this stuff coming? What is the minister in our day to do while a pride march makes its way down the main street of his town? And what are we to do when the world closes in with threats of death unless we shut our gospel preaching mouths? We must continue to preach the soul-saving, sin-killing, joy-filling gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must take the counsel Paul gives to Timothy in verse 14. In the face of all of this terrible stuff Paul describes, he says, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have heard them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
the scriptures, the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. If you're here today and you are not saved, you're not a believer in Jesus, but you know that you're going to stand someday before God and be judged, and you want to believe in Jesus, begin to read the scriptures, for in there the wisdom that leads to salvation is found. Get you a Bible and start reading and praying your way through the Gospel of John. That whole book is written so that people who read it will come to faith in the Lord Jesus and have their sins forgiven. From childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, you know, we've, we've gone from Genesis all the way to, to Timothy and, and we have described humanity as a, as a wretched lot of evil people. And we are, by nature, born to our mothers, once to our mothers, we're a mess. Judged already and damned to misery. But listen what he says to Timothy. It's hard to deal with. Pride March down Central uh, Street in, in Globe, Arizona. How do you deal with that? People knocking on our doors and saying, I listened to a sermon online where you talked against homosexuality and, and lesbians and, and we're coming after you. Well, Joe just locked the door, so there's some resistance back there. <laughs> there's a few armed people in the congregation. But that's not as unlikely as you might think. Will you stand for Jesus? And, and how, do you, how do you deal with this? What tools do you bring to bear upon a wicked world that we live with? He tells us in verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be equipped for every good work in every season, in every circumstance. Preach the gospel, Mr. Skaggs. Keep doing what you've done for many, many years. And you folks, keep doing what you know is right to do, calling men and women to faith in Jesus Christ because it is appointed unto men once to die and we will all stand before God in judgment. Irreversible then. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Dear believers in Jesus I counsel you to cling to him, cling to his word, cling to his promises, and know that nothing that might be coming your way can remove you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Rest your weary soul in Jesus. You who by the recommendation of this fallen world have been following your own heart and have found it to be deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, you who are disillusioned and disappointed and empty, to you I proclaim the good news that a Savior has died in our place. He has paid for our sins so that be, by believing in Him you will be forgiven and made a child of God unaccusable, acceptable in Christ and on your way to heaven. Christians, hang on to what you got. Unbelievers, run to Christ. Embrace Him. Receive Him. Believe in Him. Follow Him. John 3.18 Our situation is not something we need to wait or ought to wait to deal with. Our situation is now. I can't tell you statistically how many people have died while I've been preaching this message. Whisk off into eternity with and without the Lord Jesus. Will it be me next? 
I'm 71, so old people generally die. Perhaps I'm close on the trail of my end. But young people die too, and everyone in between. When God takes a person out of this life, it's irrevocable, it's ir irreversible, and, and it, is, it, it comes like a thief in the night. Nobody sends you a, a note and says, at 8 o'clock, it's over. It comes, and so we need to be ready. Now listen to John 3.18. He who believes in Jesus is not judged right now. All your sins forgiven, slate wiped clean is not judged now and never will be. The scripture says that there is therefore now no condemnation, not in this life, not in the judgment, for those who are in Christ Jesus. But he who does not believe has been judged already, the sentence already resting on our shoulders. Why? Not because you've been a worse person than everybody else. You see, there is no goodness in humanity at all. And God requires perfection. You can only find it in Jesus. Amen. Why is he judged already? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from the coming wrath. Trust in anything else and you'll be rejected. Try to get to God by a religion of your own manufacture, by saying, well, this is okay, and that's okay, it doesn't matter. God will understand my, he sees my heart. What's he see when he sees your heart? A black mess. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You need a new heart. Amen. You gotta get a new heart. A new mindset comes when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope today will be the day you cry out to Christ to forgive your sins and make you a child of God.